one thing, that shows how poor you are when you don't have teeth. I mean, everybody knows that. <laughs> I don't care who comes into government. It can be a cat, it can be a dog, as far as I'm concerned. We lost to a fish that had sex with a deaf girl. Tweaks to Twitter's algorithm designed to suppress troll-like behavior are affecting prominent Republicans. Vice News found that searches for several conservative figures, including Donald Trump Jr.'s spokesman and the Republican Party chair, don't automatically appear in Twitter's search bar, a process known as shadow banning, but that the same isn't true for similar Democrats. A Twitter spokesperson told Vice News they're aware of affected accounts and are making changes. Judges in California are considering whether to overturn the attempted rape conviction of former Stanford University swimmer Brock Turner. His lawyer argued Turner didn't intend to commit rape during a party in 2016 because Turner was clothed and only wanted to have, quote, outer course, which his lawyer defines as sex with clothes on. California's appellate court has 90 days to consider the appeal. The first evidence of a large body of liquid water has been found on Mars. Researchers from the Italian Space Agency used radar to discover what they believe is a 12-mile diameter reservoir, nearly a mile beneath the planet's southern polar ice cap. The discovery could be a big step in finding signs of life, if future expeditions to Mars corroborate the report. The European Union's highest court has found Kit Kat's four-fingered design isn't famous enough across the EU to be trademarked ending an 11-year legal battle waged by Nestle. The decision is a relief for Mondelez, which led the challenge, and makes a four-fingered bar of its own. Norway's Kvicklunge. The White House says it's still considering stripping the security clearances of six prominent former officials, but that it hasn't made any decisions yet. Press Secretary Sarah Sanders all but admitted that the move was targeted at people who've been critical of the president. They've politicized and in some cases monetized their public service and security clearances. But it could have repercussions across a community of national security professionals that's far bigger than most people think. As of October of 2016, more than 4 million Americans had a security clearance, meaning they were approved for access to classified materials. That's a really big number. After the Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning leaks, the government has tried to do a better job of evaluating and monitoring people with clearances. And the number has gone down. In 2011, 4.8 million people had some kind of clearance. The most recent report shows that by 2016, that number had dropped by about 800,000. Now, not all of the 4 million clearance holders have access to top secret material, but it's a pretty good bet that the people Sarah Sanders singled out, John Brennan, James Comey, James Clapper, Michael Hayden, Susan Rice, and Andrew McCabe had the highest level of clearance. Two of those people, Comey and McCabe, had their clearance revoked because they were fired from their jobs. But the others, whether they choose to use the clearance or not, are still eligible for access to information that most of us don't have. Yes, the White House's talk of revoking these clearances is pure political revenge, but it's worth asking why these people need their clearance at all after leaving the government. There's oftentimes still interaction at those levels for obvious reasons because of the expertise that these people have and also because so many of the endeavors and investigations and operations carry on from one administration to the other. So most of these people, if not almost all in the past put aside their political opposition, if there even is any, so that they can work together towards the betterment of the United States. Continuity of government seems like a pretty good reason to keep your clearance, but having a clearance can be lucrative too. Not necessarily for the Haydens and Clappers of the world who have TV and book deals, but for the other four million people whose names you don't know. Having a current security clearance is the Willy Wonka golden ticket. This is the difference between, for many people, staying employed, and for others, having a salary that may be two, three, four times what you could otherwise receive if you didn't have a security clearance. I have a security clearance. That means I can represent some people in a classified environment when others cannot. So I get that business when others do not. And Zaid thinks the White House is sending a message to those people. That's the message that's being sent 
to the four to five million people who have security clearances in and outside the government that you cannot politically express your First Amendment rights uh, and viewpoints without being concerned you may lose your pr the privileges that come with protecting the national security of the United States. Republican governors across the country are working to roll back the Obama administration's Medicaid expansion, which added more low-income people to the program. They're imposing a new requirement that forces some people to work to keep their coverage. The poster child for this policy is Kentucky, where beneficiaries will have to work 80 hours a month to earn their medical care and could be facing the highest premiums ever approved under Medicaid. The policy is going to affect nearly half a million people, and nearly 100,000 might end up losing coverage. For the last month, the Medicaid expansion population in Kentucky have been treated like pawns. The lady that I know that works with Johnny Christian Healthcare called me. Did you know that they canceled dental? I was like, no, I didn't know that. And here I am, I got, I'm like right in the middle of having my whole mouth done. That's because Kentucky Governor Matt Bevan has been playing a political game with their healthcare. After his plan to overhaul Medicaid was temporarily blocked by a judge, Bevin cut dental, vision, and transportation benefits for nearly half a million people. What are you having done? What are you I'm having, having this, I'm getting dentures on the top, which is embarrassing to say for the people. Why is so, it embarrassing? Why do you say it's embarrassing? Well, you know, for one thing, that shows how poor you are when you don't have teeth. I mean, everybody knows that. <laughs> you probably can't afford dentures or something like that. Susan Wells is in between jobs right now and qualifies for Medicaid under the expansion. She hopes that when she gets her teeth fixed, she'll start working as an Uber driver. I want to work. I want to work, you know, as an Uber driver. Some way where I can, you know, benefit. If they just give the insurance, I'll pay taxes, do everything, everything, everything will be fine. Miss Susan Wells, how are we? Person want to get you now, as we always do. Yeah. Susan was mid-treatment, so the nonprofit where she goes for dental care said they'd pick up the tab. The governor's cuts to dental turned out to be a PR disaster. Just days after we talked to Susan, he reinstated benefits. But people under Medicaid expansion still face the possibility of losing their health insurance if they can't prove they're working 80 hours a month. Everybody used to work in coal mines and stuff like that, and there are no coal mines no more. No, there's nothing, nothing. He goes out and tries to find odd jobs every now and then, but because we got to make some kind of income right now. There just ain't nothing to do around here no more, period. Sarah and Pop Jaw Woods became part of the Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act, and it's helped cover treatment for Sarah's back issues and Pop's high cholesterol. Until 2014, I never did have no insurance. Ever, if I had to go to the doctor, I paid for it out of my pocket. When this insurance came out in 2014, it was the best thing that ever happened to us. Before insurance, how would you have afforded the medicine? I couldn't. You wouldn't have been able to afford any of them? I wouldn't have been able to get none of that. I wouldn't even be able to go to the doctor to find out why I need this medicine, you know what I'm saying? When they heard the governor got approval from the Trump administration to make people work for their Medicaid, potentially kicking 95,000 people off the program, the Woods joined a class action lawsuit. We're poor. We want to make sure the poor people have insurance, you know what I'm saying? Because me and her have been poor all of our life, and we know how it is to have insurance and not to have insurance. And I hate to say it, but the people that's fighting to take the insurance away from us is the rich people. Just days before the work requirement was supposed to roll out in July, a federal judge sided with the Woods and ruled that hiking Medicaid premiums and adding work requirements goes against the fundamental purpose of Medicaid, which is to ensure low-income people. But that ruling hasn't stopped the governor who's still intent on rolling out his plan by the fall. And the Woods, who make around $1,000 a month, are worried that they won't be able to afford it. The rent here is 300, then you, you electric, you water, then if you have a phone, you gotta pay that. We make it month to month. Right, right. And sometimes we don't even make it at the end of the month. At the heart of the debate over work requirements taking place across the country is a deeper philosophical fight about what Medicaid is. To some, it's a health insurance program, where the more people you have insured, the better. To others, it's a welfare trap that should have as few recipients as possible. 
There is dignity associated with earning the value of something that you receive. Governor Bevan and the state health cabinet didn't respond to repeated requests for an interview. But we sat down with Republican state representative Adia Wushner, the chair of Kentucky's House Committee on Health and Family Services. Why do you think that work requirements are going to work? It's an incentive. I think that there is dignity in work. It's something that is about the, the, the human person. So often I, I say that our, our, sometimes our charity becomes toxic to people. In our wanting to help them, sometimes we've, we've hurt them. In, in a sense, you're, you're making people work for their health care. Let's make sure we're always clear on, we're not talking about the vulnerable, but we're talking about a, a population that has the capabilities of working. I think people go to work every day so that they can have the benefits and they can have the means to support their family. And I believe if you really got down to it, people want to feel like they're contributing. We rob them of that opportunity if we keep them in a system that long where it sort of disincentivizes them to go back to work. There doesn't seem to be a concrete plan of how you're going to actually bring sustainable there, work well, to those parts there is. of the state, it's going to the rural on, but parts it, it of the It gets state. lost because we're talking about health care. But then if you go and you talk to workforce development people, you're going to hear all the stuff that they're doing. The jobs will come. We have to have the people to work. But some doctors in Kentucky say that rolling back health benefits will lead to less people working, not more. These are my people. These are mountain people. I was born and raised here. I was in their shoes at one time. Dr. Bill Collins is the now, dental clinic director at Redbird it. Mission, which serves three of the poorest counties in the state. So when you hear politicians talking about the fact that people need to work so that they can sort of be healthy, contributing members of society, and yet in the same breath they are taking away health benefits. What do you think? I think you're defeating the purpose. You've got to have people healthy in order to be able to work. If you're an employer and somebody walks in and you see black teeth, you're going to take their application and it's going to put, be put back in the file. I think that no one should want to be on a habitual Medicaid or a lifetime on Medicaid. I think Medicaid should be a way out of poverty. Let's get these people healthy, let's find them jobs, and then help the next person. On Monday, voters in Zimbabwe will get their first chance to choose a new leader after 40 years under a dictatorship. 23 candidates are running in a tight race to occupy the seat Robert Mugabe held until last year, when a military coup pushed him out and power fell to his vice president, Emerson Manangagwa. Zimbabweans are taking advantage of new freedoms in a country where Mugabe once crushed political opposition and any hint of free speech. At no political agenda, Tungo represents our own future. Room 25. And this guy. Thank you to all. To all, to all, to all, to all, to all. A year ago, activist Marshal Shonhai criticized Zimbabwe's politicians. Now, he wants to be one. The bigger picture of returning to civilian rule and you know, full democracy and all that, at a local level, I believe that as, as people, we need to take responsibility of our community. Shonhai is running for city council in the same district where Robert Mugabe once founded his ZANU PF party and lived in this house. People would, would uh, express uh, displeasure towards the government behind closed doors. We had this feeling about that everyone is spying on you, everyone is listening in on you. Or even for me to come out and, and campaign freely in this manner was not possible. We're in the middle of the street and you're shouting, no more ZANU PF. Before November, would you have felt safe? Because Munangagwa has created this sort of freedom for you to speak, Will you give him your vote? No, 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 no. Why? Tell me why. We need new generation like this. That's that. President Munangagwa's history with Mugabe is going to make it difficult to convince voters like her that ZANU-PF can offer anything different. 
People here come run and gag with a crocodile for how he manoeuvred to stay in power. And the leading opposition candidate, Nelson Chamisa, is capitalising on that. It has not changed. I mean, in fact, it's very clear that uh, what has changed is just the haircut, but not the person. The crocodile still has teeth. Well, you know, the crocodile is in the habit of shedding crocodile tears, and those tears are not usually authentic. With Mugabe's past a toxic and divisive topic, Munungagwa is embarking on a massive rebranding effort. By 2030, we want Zimbabwe to be a middle-class economy. Back in Harare, at a rally in the wealthy suburb of Borodale, Munungagwa pushed the same message, but to a very different audience. Could you have ever imagined a time when you'd have had this many white people sat here dressed in Zanu PF regalia? Never. Listening never. to the president? Never, never thought it would happen before. But it, I mean, it goes show there's confidence, isn't there? Mugabe, famous for saying the only white person you can trust is a dead white person, never recognised them as citizens. A farmer, a black farmer, a white farmer is a Zimbabwean farmer. We should look at that way. Zimbabwe is great. <laughs> the message seems to be, let's leave the past behind us. Sure. Does Zanu PF take responsibility for some of the things that have happened in the past? move forward. How, how do you persuade voters that ZANU-PF is a different party? Because we are saying we want to build the Zimbabwe we want. The Zimbabwe, every Zimbabwean would enjoy. And what was and preventing already, that before? What was preventing that in the past? You want us to go back into history? Do you, are you serious about that? We can't go on and on about it, you know, in history. Savannah Madabombe was a vocal critic of Mugabe and was forced to live in exile in the US. After the coup, she saw an opportunity to come home. I always had hope of coming back and saying, look, I want to, I want to live in my country, but it was impossible. What I'm doing right now, I couldn't have done it, just organizing people without getting authorization from anybody and just saying, look, guys, let's change the spaces what, that we live in. Along with a team of volunteers, she's trying to change the face of the capital in her own small way. The group takes on some of the civic responsibilities ignored by the city council and calls out politicians on social media who they feel should be doing more. For Savannah, her new freedom to say and do as she thinks in the home she once fled is more important than her freedom to choose a new leader on Monday. I don't care who comes into government. It can be a cat, it can be a dog, as far as I'm concerned. I don't really care. We are the people can take care of ourselves. Today, SpaceX launched a set of broadband communication satellites into orbit on one of its Falcon 9 rockets. Commercial launches like these are now the leading edge of American innovation in space seeming to take over the spot long occupied by NASA. But the reality is that NASA had a lot to do with creating the private space industry in the first place. I started with NASA in 1985. Even before then, I had an interest in the commercialization of space. I've always felt that just like our own frontier in this country, the government goes, cavalry build a fort, the settlers arrive and the army moves on. That paradigm should apply to space as well. At the time I joined, it was still the Apollo program people, the very can-do approach that we can do anything, brilliant team who only knew one way of doing business, to develop systems that the government would own and operate. And it worked very, very well. But by the start of the 21st century, NASA was struggling. The International Space Station was delayed, and the Space Shuttle Columbia exploded, killing seven astronauts. In 2004, President Bush issued a new space policy, calling on NASA to partner with and invest in private companies. In 2005, we stood up the COTS program. COTS is the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services, a program that stimulates development of private sector capabilities. 
The goal was for companies to demonstrate that they could carry cargo to low Earth orbit. In the first round of the COTS investment, we picked SpaceX and rocket plane Kistler. SpaceX was doing well. Rocket plane Kistler, unfortunately, wasn't. So when they dropped out, we then had the second round, and we picked Orbital ATK as the new second partner. NASA's space shuttle program ended in 2011. But by the next year, SpaceX was ferrying cargo to the ISS, followed by Orbital's inaugural flight in 2013. Between the two companies, they've flown more than 20 resupply missions. The COTS program was more successful than we ever imagined it could be. Not only did it help NASA get cargo to the space station in a reliable, cost-effective manner, but it created a whole new industry. Look at what we did with the Falcon 9. We invested technical support and money in SpaceX. They have sold that to launch satellites around the world. America's market share in that global communication satellite launch market had pretty much fallen to zero. And now, almost half the world's market has come back to the United States. We're doing that same model today on lunar transportation, a perfect mixture of government and the private sector working together to explore space. I think there will always be that model of NASA doing the difficult things and the dangerous stuff and the private sector moving in behind to help build on what NASA's done. Little Rail Howery. Today I'm gonna explore the internet and see what rumors and dumb things they tend to say about me in headlines or just even in tweets or whatever. Welcome to Vicepedia. This actually looks weird when I see that. Like when I see Batman, Spider Man all doing their stuff and then just me on a cell phone. I thought Jordan Peele was smart by making a hero just a regular friend. Ron Howard did a screen and it was like some of the oldest white Academy voters I've ever seen in my life. The party scene in Get Out, it was literally happening to me about Get Out. When black people see Rod, they applaud him for just keeping it real. What those older white people just saw, just thank you for giving us a relief because we couldn't, we can't possibly think it's white people just evil because we're white. But I'm like, bro, like, yeah, it's some real shit. Get Out Star says actors practice award show losing face. It's weird if you take a joke and be like, this is a headline. Like, come on, man, ain't nobody in the bathroom looking in the mirror like, oh yeah, this is how I'm gonna look when I lose. I'm happy with the Oscars that they didn't put the camera on me when Shape of Water won. Cause we lost to a fish that had sex with a deaf girl. But it was defending my homegirl like an idiot. I get out the car to help her because she just got in the car and she just pulls off. So now I'm dealing with this big crazy dude. And the police showed up, I was like, oh, I'm happy to see you. I'm like, what y'all doing? Wait, y'all locking me up? They said I punched his, I couldn't even reach his face. I wasn't released on bond, they just let me out. I didn't have to pay anything. Literally any fight I've been in, it's been because of me defending one of my homegirls. I pass out write a note. First of all, if you didn't want us to fucking curse, you should have told us that. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but then read what they wrote. Lil Rail's cutting up, breaking up with bad barbers and bad bitches. What? That wasn't even none of my bits. Enjoy the ha ha holidays and be shit. What the who wrote this? This is one of the worst synopsis of anything I've ever seen in my life. Like some fucking bad 16-year-old teen wrote this? Born December 17, 1979, that's true. Pictures, this, this is a stupid ass picture. I have so many better pictures than this weird one on this brick wall where it looked like I'm like happily getting arrested. When you take pictures, you can't play around. Like a lot of times when you try to be like being an asshole, being sarcastic, that's usually the picture they keep. You do something stupid like, ah, I don't care. And then they be like, oh, that's the picture of your sitcom. I'm like, damn. Lil Rel Howery is an American actor comedian. His net worth is $800,000. Sure, 
whatever keeps the government off your ass. Sure, that's what it is. Ha, 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 ha.